Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Budget Day. It's a um, very special day every year. Uh, today, to help uh, commemorate the occasion, a very, a very special day every year. Uh, and to help commemorate the occasion, we have two very special guests. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to uh, introduce to you Ambassador John Bass. He is, of course, is the acting uh, Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources. Uh, and our colleague Paloma Adams Allen. She is uh, the USAID Deputy Administrator for Management and Resources. Uh, both will offer some opening remarks on the FY 2024 uh, budget request for the Department of State and USAID. And then we'll take your questions and then we'll proceed to our normal programming. So, with that, that's the best. Great. Thank you, Ned. Colleagues, good afternoon. Great to be with you. Uh, and before I start, I just want to take a minute to thank Ned for his so remarkable service and leadership. It's it's not Ned Price Day, but maybe it should be. Uh, and I, <laughs> but I, you know, I know I speak for all of our colleagues in uh, in wishing you all the best with your next uh, adventure. Uh, and as Ned mentioned, I'm joined today by my friend and colleague Paloma Adams Allen, uh, Deputy U.S. AID Administrator for Management and Resources. Um, and we're here, of course, to present the highlights of the fiscal year 24 budget request for the department and for the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, the resources detailed in our combined fiscal year 2024 budget are essential to the Department of State and USAID's work to advance the Biden administration's vision of a free, open, secure, and prosperous world while delivering on issues that matter most to the lives and livelihoods of our fellow Americans. The President's FY24 budget request requests $63.1 billion for state and USAID. This is a $4.9 billion uh, increase, roughly 9% increase above what Congress enacted for comparable state NAID programs in fiscal year 23. And we deeply appreciate the support and partnership from Congress in resourcing uh, this department and USAID to meet the moment that we face. The budget is an extension of principled clear-eyed leadership by the United States in the face of a set of generational challenges that require sustained commitments to address. First, as you've heard so often from the Secretary, our approach towards the generational challenge posed by the PRC focuses on investing in our own domestic capabilities, aligning our efforts with those of allies and partners, and competing with the PRC where interests and values differ. Our competition with the PRC is unusually broad and complex, which requires a different approach than traditional budgeting. And to meet this challenge, therefore, this budget requests mandatory spending on top of the traditional discretionary resources within the budget. As part of an interagency mandatory proposal, uh, the state AID budget request includes, uh, in mandatory spending, $2 billion to strengthen Indo-Pacific economies and supporting our partners in pushing back against predatory and opportunistic competition by China. $2 billion to support high-quality, strategic, hard infrastructure projects globally. $2 billion for a new revolving fund at the Development Finance Corporation to boost equity investments, and $7.1 billion over 20 years to support the renewal of the Compacts of Free Association. We believe that discretionary resources alone cannot meet the needs posed by this generational challenge, and we believe it is imperative to have mandatory, reliable funding 
to prevail in this competition with China. Second priority is to ensure that we continue to carry forward uh, our pivotal work as part of the broader administration efforts to ensure that Russia's aggression in Ukraine remains a strategic failure while supporting the Ukrainian government and the people of Ukraine. The FY24 budget will advance that commitment while promoting oversight and accountability to ensure taxpayer resources are appropriately spent and accounted for. Third, we are mobilizing and enhancing resources to address shared global challenges, including economic challenges, energy challenges, food security, health security, the, the climate crisis, and other uh, challenges that defy national borders, uh, such as irregular migration. And we will continue to work together to shore up fellow democracies and build resist resilience against authoritarian efforts to undermine democratic states and democratic norms. Fourth, the budget will continue our work to ensure U.S. interests and values are protected in the digital and emerging technology sector, including through the CHIPS International Technology Security and Innovation Fund, for which we are grateful to Congress for providing us uh, with $500 million over five years to empower the department to work with our partners and allies in securing and expanding our cr crucial semiconductor supply chains and promoting the adoption of trustworthy telecom architecture and technologies. Fifth, we will continue the Secretary's ambitious agenda to modernize American diplomacy and our diplomatic operations globally to ensure we're equipped to address the challenges and seize the opportunities presented to us in the coming years. In addition to these five major priorities, I just want to take a minute to highlight several other critical investments uh, that the budget proposes. Uh, to support all that we are doing globally, our request includes over 500 new staff positions for the State Department. And these will focus primarily on expanding our footprint in the Indo-Pacific region, increasing professional development and training options to ensure our personnel are best prepared to meet some of these complex challenges, and bolstering our consular staff to meet unprecedented demand for passports, visas, and other services. We will also continue to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility initiatives to include our broader efforts to recruit and retain a diverse workforce that reflects the true, true breadth uh, of representation and diversity across this nation. We also are requesting $6.3 billion to protect our diplomats, our embassies, and our data, which will in help us to secure our global workforce from a wide array of threats to their health and safety, help us address infrastructure vulnerabilities, um, and ensure that we are securing sensitive data. Um, and finally, uh, I want to address one component that I know matters to many of our fellow citizens uh, and to people around the world. Um, as the department takes over responsibility from the Department of Defense for key aspects of our ongoing relocation of Afghan partners under Operation Enduring Welcome, we are requesting that Congress establish an Enduring Welcome program account to provide a consolidated, flexible funding source to meet our commitment in the months and years ahead to those who served alongside us in Afghanistan. So with that, I would like to turn the podium over to uh, my colleague, Paloma adams Allen to uh, uh, preview the top lines for USAID. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ned. Good afternoon, everyone. The President's FY24 budget ref request reflects the decisive juncture at which the United States finds itself. 
with an opportunity to lead the world in extending the reach of human dignity to all. The requested funds will allow the United States to continue to support our country partners on the front lines of multiple overlapping crises, including responding to climate change and food insecurity. The FY24 budget request for USCID is $32 billion in um, fully and partially managed accounts, an increase of $3 billion or 10% above the FY23 adjusted and acted levels. It includes vital assistance to support American foreign policy priorities, including additional resources to assist the people of Ukraine and all of those impacted by Putin's brutal invasion and confronting the rise of autocracy and anti-democratic threats posed by the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. There is significant funding to help our partners and allies bolster democracy, fight corruption, strengthen global health security, and combat infectious diseases, and much more. So I'll highlight some of them now. As the United States governments lead on humanitarian assistance, USAID responds to more than 75 crises in 65 countries on an annual basis, including currently in Ukraine and the recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria. This year's budget, budget requests $10.5 billion in humanitarian assistance, $6.5 billion of which will be administered by USAID. To assist Ukraine and manage the aftershocks of Putin's invasion, the request includes $469 million to bolster the economy and ensure the continuity of government services, strengthen their energy infrastructure and cybersecurity, and ultimately promote the resilience of the Ukrainian people. It also includes 1.11 billion um, to help us advance the administration's root causes strategy and deliver on the president's four billion four-year commitment to strengthen the region as a coalition of resilient democracies that can deliver security, development, and economic opportunities for its people. To reaffirm continued U.S. global health leadership, the budget requests $4.1 billion for USAID managed accounts to combat infectious diseases, prevent child and maternal health deaths, bolster nutrition, control the HIV AIDS epidemic, and provide dedicated funding to support and protect the global health workforce through the President's Global Health Worker Initiative. This includes $745 million for USAID to prepare for, prevent, detect, and respond to future infectious disease threats. The global challenges that I've outlined here continue to disproportionately impact women and girls, especially in crisis and conflict settings, including limiting their access to educational, economic, and leadership opportunities. The budget will support implementation of the National Strategy for Gender Equity and Equality through a historic request of $3.1 billion for state and USAID to uplift the role of women and girls in all of their diversity. Specifically, the request includes $200 million for the Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund to advance women's economic security. In addition to providing USAID with critical programmatic resources, the budget recognizes that in order to continue to advance critical foreign policy priorities and ensure accountability of U.S. taxpayer dollars, the agency must be fit for purpose. In light of this, we're requesting $2.3 billion for USCID to build a responsive and resilient workforce and strengthen its operations globally. These funds will position us to increase the size and diversity of the permanent career workforce by 230 positions, provide flexibility to hire non-career direct hire staff for a crisis response, and address shortages in key technical and operational functions. In sum, the FY24 budget request demonstrates American values and identifies priorities that will strengthen our national security through investments in development and humanitarian assistance. Thank you for your interest and happy to take questions. Excellent, thank you both. Say uh, questions, Matt? Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, Deputy Secretary, this is for you. Um, and I realize this is kind of a drop in the bucket of a $63 billion budget request, but I'm curious about the $150 million you're asking for to uh, for UNESCO. Um, because although there had been talk about rejoining uh, 
Um, it had never been official. This seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, but this is the first time that you guys have sought uh, money to pay these arrears. And I'm just wondering, uh, how serious are you about this? Because apart from the broader question of how, you know, what a lot of people think is that the entire federal budget is DOA on the Hill anyway, but how serious are, is the State Department about wanting to rejoin UNESCO, and how will you overcome the legal challenges, um, either the legal hurdle, uh, to do it. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, we appreciate the waiver authority we received in the uh, omnibus for this fiscal year that that gives us a path to uh, begin the process of rejoining UNESCO uh, should we uh, elect to do so as an administration. Um, we're currently considering carefully those options. Um, I would also say if we do rejoin, if we do choose to rejoin, uh, it will help address a critical gap in our global leadership toolkit and capacity. And it will also help us address a key opportunity cost that our absence is creating um, in our uh, global competition with China. Um, I think a lot of the focus on UNESCO overlooks the extent to which that entity is an essential element of setting and shaping standards for, among other things, STEM education around the world. Um, so if we're really serious about the digital age competition with China, um, from my perspective, in a clear-eyed set of interests, we can't afford to be absent any longer uh, from one of the key fora in which standards around education for science and technology are set. Um, and there are a number of other examples in that space of UNESCO's mission um, where our absence is noticed and where it undercuts our ability to be as effective in promoting our vision uh, of a free, uh, free world. Andrew. How will this, beyond uh, enduring welcome, how will this help address the problems of repatriating more Afghan SIVs and others, and some who are caught in third countries? Uh, you know, you could give us some, some detail as to what the commitment in this budget is compared to last year's. Sure. Um, so in specific budget terms, you will not see new money in the State Department's budget. Um, that's because we assess that the resources that we are receiving through a transfer from uh, DOD and the ODACA account gives us uh, uh, enough to work with for the current fiscal year and for fiscal year 24 uh, to sustain a robust effort uh, to continue to relocate Afghans who wish to leave Afghanistan uh, to the United States or, or other third countries. Um, uh, in addition to that, that financial piece, um, we have um, a set of positions, a set of people in the department uh, and at uh, a number of locations overseas who are continuing to work full time uh, on this vexing challenge. Um, I have to say in 35 years uh, in this business, this is one of the most complicated, um, challenging problems to deal with, and it, it is going to continue to take a really sustained focus, uh, which Secretary Blinken, myself, and many colleagues across uh, this department are absolutely committed to. You know this better than anyone, having been on the ground. Um, so you're in a unique position to assess, I mean, the criticisms at the hearing yesterday were, were pretty direct. I mean, could we just ask how you feel the State Department is addressing this? Because a lot of us are still getting appeals from people, including some who've come here and just can't get jobs. So um, I'd say a couple of things. Um, uh, you know, like many, I was moved by the testimony yesterday. Um, of people across this country, representing people across this country who care deeply about Afghans and Afghanistan. And that's a reflection of the breadth and depth of a 20-year commitment, um, of which thousands of my colleagues here in the department were, were also a part. Um, 
the that depth and breadth of commitment for such a long time is manifested in so many different ways um, for individuals. And we see the reflection of that both in the continued scale of of need, the outreach, um, the individual stories of Afghans who are still looking for support. Um, it, we're not going to be able to meet that need in the moment as quickly as all of us wish we could. Um, but that does not mean we are not going to do everything possible to do right by as many people, to keep faith with as many Afghans to whom we have an obligation as we can. Um, and it's why we are continuing to build out that capacity and ensure that we have sustainable capacity in the department to keep at this for as long as it takes. Um, thank you for doing this, Ambassador. I have a quick question on um, the funding related to competition with China. And um, this proposal includes $2 billion to support high quality strategic hard infrastructure projects globally. And that's part of the portion of the budget where it speaks about outcompeting China. But obviously when you look at what China has done with its Belt and Road Initiative over the last year, um, reports are that it invested more than 19 billion um, in direct investments in countries for the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, you know, 19 more than 19 billion and 2 billion are just numbers that are completely at odds with one another. So how do you outcompete China, particularly in this space of infrastructure investment, when the U.S. government just isn't putting it down the funds uh, that appear to be competitive? Thank you. Um, I, I think it's important to differentiate between quantity and quality. Um, we are not looking to match China dollar for dollar, um, in part because uh, uh, any number of Chinese um, investments or quote unquote investments um, don't make a lot of commercial sense. Um, and so if we're, if we're trying to do this in a thoughtful way that reflects um, economic norms and, and good business practice, um, we, we need to be uh, supporting a proper evaluation of some of this on the merits. By the same token, um, what we are finding as we are looking to support infrastructure development in, in many different countries and markets and sectors is that in an enormous number of places, um, partners, whether they're governments, whether they're companies, um, prefer to work with the United States or with our Western allies and friends. And often they are willing to do so um, uh, at, on, on the face of it, at a disadvantage in terms of what, uh, what might be on offer from the PRC. Um, so it's a matter of finding what in that particular transaction, in that particular infrastructure, is a need that they are looking for um, where a contribution uh, that's from the U.S. government or supported by the U.S. government um, would make the difference to them and give them the reassurance that we're going to be present, we're going to be partnering with them, and therefore tip the scales in their decision calculus, if you will, um, towards uh, uh, an investment other than one made by a Chinese state-owned enterprise. Can I amplify one point there? Um, where John started, I think, is a critical point because we are never going to match the PRC dollar for dollar in, in state capital in a, a state-run uh, economy like the PRCs. But where we can compete and, in fact, outcompete is by harnessing the power of the American private sector, of private sectors uh, in our closest allies and partners. That is precisely the objective of uh, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, uh, the initiative that President Biden launched with his G7 partners in 2021. You talked about $19 billion that the PRC has put forward. This is an initiative that uh, is going to bring together hundreds of billions of dollars over uh, the next uh, five or so years. So uh, it is a whole of society effort. It is what we can put forward in our budget. It is what our private sector uh, can put forward itself, and it's what uh, our closest partners and allies can do, again, with, with their private sectors as well. Do you know how much of those hundreds of billion dollars have actually been committed up until this point? Because, you know, some of these projects are in countries where 
um, U.S. business might not be all that interested in the returns they might get. We, we can get you a list of, of current projects. Uh, uh, yeah, Simon? Um, yeah, I wanted to drill down on um, some of the funding that is mentioned uh, for, it's also related to China, but for Indo-Pacific partnerships and alliances. Um, I think it's $2.3 billion for this towards the Indo-Pacific strategy and mentions especially the Pacific Islands. How much of that $2.3 billion is for uh, Pacific Islands, and, and and I wonder if you could say how much of that is new. I guess in relation to the the summit that happened last year, there was some uh, new funding pledge, but it's it's unclear exactly how much of that is sort of additional to uh, previous funding that was there, and how much specifically for the for the Pacific Islands. Uh, let us get back to you in terms of differentiating between commitments last year um, and and this particular funding. Um, uh, I can't recall precisely uh, uh, how much of that was future projections last year. Um, but what I would say is um, we are envisioning this as a flexible instrument that allows us to, again, mobilize partnerships with, um, with individual allies and with constellations of countries in the region and those partners who also have uh, enduring interests um, and support for the Indo-Pacific um, to maximize our ability to support those nations and work on common problems, um, whether that's climate change adaptation, um, whether that's uh, um, energy security going forward, things like that. Alex? Thanks so much, Ted. I thank you both for coming down here. I wonder how much of your programs that are designed to help for Ukraine's reconstruction and other impacted countries uh, have a room for potentially relying on seize Russian money, you know, uh, and if there's any back channel work going on in terms of how, to, how much to focus on and also how to allocate that funding. So the, the resources we've uh, described today uh, in general terms are, are, are coming from uh, the U.S. budget. Um, so uh, anything that might involve uh, uh, Russian assets uh, would be an entirely separate conversation, and I would defer to uh, some of my colleagues who are, are much more conversant with those issues at this time. Excellent. Uh, we'll take uh, one more question. Go ahead. Ms. Allen, you talked about uh, $10.5 billion for humanitarian uh, assistance, and uh, you mentioned also responses to more than 75 crises in 65 countries on an annual basis, including the recent earthquakes uh, impacted Syria and uh, Turkey. Is there anything for Turkey and um, Syria um, earthquake um, impacted areas in the current budget, proposed budget for, for the next fiscal year or not? So the budget was put together prior to the earthquake. Um, so we're responding to the current situation using our existing resources, um, including resources in FY23. Um, we do have always built in contingency funding for unplanned crises and so that is built into our FY24 ask, and so if that's needed, we would deploy those as needed. Yep. Um, the DNI um, is set to declassify from 18 agencies, including state, uh, information that indicts the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but not other information which might indict other institutions, including U.S. institutions. I asked last month about USAID's PREDICT program funding bioweapons agents discovery research through EcoHealth Alliance. You funded such bioweapon agents discovery research done by Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina and the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Meanwhile, uh, USAID has not released unclassified information as FOIA'd uh, by US Right to Know, the transparency group from 2020, going on three years causing the group to start litigation against USAID. Question, why does USAID fund bioweapons agents discovery research? In particular, why has USAID funded bioweapons agents discovery research performed in collaboration with China, which may have caused the pandemic? Take that one. Sure. Um, thank you both very much, Deputy yes. Secretary, Deputy, thank Deputy Minister. Oh, thank you very much for 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 for, for your time. We can we can we we can we can we can respond in writing on uh, a question that specific. 
I'm not asking <clears throat> about some obscure we, stuff. Um, I'm we have asking about what Sam, the program thanks. that you ran, that you continue to run, that could have caused the pandemic. Can you answer? Can she? She's walking Sam, out of the our, our, what we fund around the world is biosafety programs. Uh, we, we are working around the world uh, with partners to prevent uh, the sort of thing that we have suffered over the course of the past two years. Now, there, there is an effort underway, as we've talked about, to determine the origins of COVID-19. Uh, that is an effort that lives with the intelligence community. You heard from our intelligence community leaders uh, last uh, yesterday uh, the current state of those assessments. We're going to let them speak to the assessments. The short answer is uh, we don't know the origins uh, of COVID-19. There are two primary theories. Our intelligence community continues to look into that. But our priority around the world when it comes to our funding, and including when it comes to the program you're referencing, is biosafety, Sam. Uh, I have, well Sam, we, we need, well Sam, you're I, I ask that you be respectful to your, to your colleagues. I would, I, to I, US right to know I, that FOIA documents relevant to this issue in 2020, going on three years, that are in litigation and you want to hide this fact. You and the rest of the U.S. government wants to pin this solely on the Wuhan Institute. Sam, I, I would ask that you be respectful you, of your colleagues. I'm being very respectful. You're, you're I'm being not, respectful in fact. of all of the people and all of the suffering from the pandemic. Will you release the information? Sam, um, as, 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 as a program that could have caused the pandemic. Sam, as I told you last time, you're welcome to send these types of detailed and questions in writing. Last month and I haven't received anything. And, and, and we, will, we will get back to you. Um, get let to me. After the Senate passes a resolution saying we're going to put out all the information on the Wuhan Institute of Virology and none of the other information. Sam, we it's need to deny and delay. We need to deny and delay. We need to. Meanwhile, you're endangering the world with these programs. Uh, let me start with one thing at the top, and and then we'll uh, Sam because you're engaging in conspiracy theories, and and and, conspiracy and these. Cons that's the exact same rhetoric that we got three years ago. Oh, it couldn't come out of a lab. It's a conspiracy, bunk. Okay, Sam, Bunk. I, release the document. I think, Why I, you I think your colleagues yet? here. I think your colleagues here want to hear about and ask about uh, matters that are not conspiratorial. That are this uh, is absurd. in fact. It's uh, absurd. After all we've been through. After all we've been through, and after all of the government's de denies and delays uh, about COVID origins, that you're Sam, saying I, that it's a conspiracy theory. When all I asked, I asked last month. Why aren't you releasing the documents and you're not releasing the documents? And meanwhile, we, DNI, we will take, as I said before, state, we will take a look at the specific question you asked and we'll get back to you. I, I don't want to waste any more of your colleagues' time. Waste, uh, waste. Uh, I have one thing at the top and then we'll turn to your questions. First, uh, today marks 16 years since Robert Bob Levinson's abduction from Kish Island, Iran. The past 16 years have caused unspeakable grief for Bob's family and Iranian authorities have yet to account for Bob's fate. We once again call on them to do so. Bob Levinson's legacy endures through the Levinson Act, which bolsters our ability to bring home hostages and wrongfully detain U.S. nationals held overseas. In July of last year, President Biden signed a new executive order that builds on the Levinson Act and reinforces the tools available to deter and disrupt hostage taking and wrongful detentions. It, Iran continues to wrongfully detain citizens of other countries for use as political leverage. This practice is outrageous and it must end. We remain committed to securing the release of Murad Tabaz, Imad Shargi, and Siamak Namazi from their wrongful detention in Iran. We are working tirelessly to bring them home. It is time for all three to return to their loved ones who have suffered for far too long. With that, Matt, would you like to kick us off? Uh, sure. I was going to ask about, ask about the PREDICT program, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I think we've exhausted that topic, or at least as much as you're going to. Uh, you're probably right. Uh, as much as you're going to, yes. you're going to ask. Um, I actually only have one question, and I know that you're not going to be able to answer it, uh, so I ask it with hesitation, but I still do. And it has to do with the Israeli finance minister mm -hmm. and whether or not um, the administration has any <laughs> issue with him uh, visiting the United States not specifically not asking you about a visa issue that you can't discuss for legal reasons, but I'm asking you about whether the administration has any um, uh, has any thoughts about whether he should or shouldn't come. Well, uh, you're right. Uh, we can't discuss the specifics of individuals' visa, uh, anyone's eligibility, ineligibility, uh, or visa status. Uh, what I uh, can say However, is that we've been clear about the remarks we heard from the minister 
a couple weeks ago now. Uh, we have since heard very clear responses from senior uh, Israeli officials, from Prime Minister Netanyahu, from President Herzog, uh, from others across the Israeli government. We very much appreciate uh, those denunciations. Uh, we have noted, too, that the minister has attempted to walk back uh, his comments. Uh, our position remains. Uh, this is a time for de-escalation. Uh, not for rhetoric that serves only uh, to escalate tensions. But uh, I'm not aware that uh, the minister has announced any particular travel plans. We wouldn't comment on uh, any hypothetical travel. Well, no, but I'm not. <laughs> I, I just, do you have a position on, 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 on whether he should or shouldn't? Not whether he's allowed to necessarily. But no? And Matt, uh, individuals are free to make their own travel plans. We have a, a role in that. I can't speak to that role when it comes to the specifics. Yeah, Leon. Can I, can I Stay on the show. Go ahead. Leon, are you yeah. at the same time? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on this because the minister himself, you know, issued a statement saying that, you know, he did not realize that his call for wiping out could be given as a direct order to pilots to go ahead and, and bomb. The, that is not an apology. Is that, is that considered an apology in your in your judgment? I, I'm, I'm not going to characterize uh, what the minister has since said. Uh, I did characterize uh, our reaction to what he said initially, and you know where we stand on that. We now know uh, where uh, senior officials across the Israeli government uh, stand on that because we've heard uh, them distance themselves, condemn, denounce uh, these remarks. Uh, the minister has since made uh, remarks. I can't speak to his uh, intent, but uh, our position is clear. Now is not the time for escalatory rhetoric. Now is not the time for any comments uh, that can only serve to exacerbate tensions. I promise to be brief. Uh, now, your French counterpart today, uh, Anne Claire Legendre, uh, called on the Israeli government to provide protection to Palestinian civilians. Would that be something that, as you know, as the governing authority, the occupying authority, would that something that the United States would consider also calling on Israel to protect the Palestinian civilians our, under its authority? Our our overriding objective, Said, uh, is to see to it that. Israelis and Palestinians alike live with equal levels of stability, of security, uh, of prosperity. Uh, that, is, uh, that has been at the crux uh, of our policy, of our approach. Uh, so this is very much um, uh, what, we seek to, uh, what we seek to affect. And lastly, uh, the Knesset today, the Israeli Parliament, uh, Foreign <coughs> Relations Committee and Security Committee, approved this morning in a parliamentary reading a bill that cancels the, the 2005 disengagement uh, in, the, in the north of the West Bank and allows Israelis to enter the area uh, again. The bill violates the Israeli government's commitment to the Bush administration and so on. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, we remain deeply concerned, as I said before, by the sharp escalation of tensions we've seen over the course uh, of, of many months now. Uh, our call to refrain from any unilateral steps uh, remains, and those steps certainly could include any decision to create a new settlement, to legalize outposts, or to allow building uh, of any kind uh, deep in the West Bank adjacent to Palestinian uh, communities or on private Palestinian land. Again, what we want to see is de-escalation. Uh, we want to see both parties take the steps that only they can take, they can take the steps that are incumbent on them to take to see a de-escalation of, ten of tensions uh, and to see to it over the longer term uh, that Israelis and Palestinians are able to work together uh, and work together cooperatively towards uh, what has been uh, the approach of successive American administrations. Uh, that is a uh, negotiated two-state solution, Israelis and Palestinians living side by side with equal measures uh, of security, of stability, of democracy, uh, of dignity as well. Andrea. Does that ex does that uh, admonition con extend to daytime raids, such as the raids that have taken place? And more broadly speaking, the U.S. commitment to Israelis and Palestinians having equal opportunities and eventually a two-state solution, how do you see that affected by the proposed changes in the judicial system and the uh, independence of the Supreme Court? So a couple things on that, Andrea. First, um, when it comes to Israel's right to defend itself, uh, that is a principle that Israel, of course, have uh, has. We have seen far too many demonstrations, vivid, awful demonstrations, including of late, uh, of the need for Israel to, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I suppose I should uh, see the uh, see the see the podium. What, what, what question were you addressing? He was doing great. So I, I don't want to interrupt the flow. I don't think you want to take this one. Oh yeah, pro probably not, or anyone for that matter. Um, thanks for letting me crash the party. Listen, I just wanted to come by to say a couple of things uh, today, and uh, I don't want to take too much time to do it, but I want to say, first of all, that uh, Ned, uh, you have been a remarkable spokesperson. Um, you all know this better than just about anyone. Ned was instrumental in restoring the daily briefings here at the, uh, the department, something that I felt very strongly about, the President felt strongly about, but Ned has really been, been driving. And if nothing else, I am so glad that we have um, restored that dialogue uh, between us. It really matters. Uh, you've had a chance under Ned's leadership to ask tough, albeit multi-part, multi-prong, multi-person questions, uh, not just to him, but uh, to, uh, to me, to other senior officials in the department. By our count, um, during his tenure, he's conducted more than 200 briefings. and. Uh, traveled to more than 50 countries uh, with me. Now, I can't say that I've watched every single briefing from start to finish. <laughs> that would not be accurate. But I know that we're all going to miss some of the more memorable moments. <laughs> like the time that Ned sparred with Matt Lee about the JCPOA. Or the time he sparred with Matt Lee about the JCPOA. <laughs> or more recently, the time that he sparred with Matt Lee about the JCPOA. Um, and I have to tell you, this is, this is true. This is not hyperbole. Uh, the number of times I've got asked on foreign travel, do you know Ned Price? Is Ned Price here? Um, if I had a dollar for each time, I'd be doing very, very well. And yes, I do, in fact, know Ned Price. And I am so much the better for it. Um, over the course of my time as Secretary, I have constantly benefited from this council, from his deep understanding of our foreign policy, and from the integrity that he brings to this job. Um, I could not have asked for a better traveling companion, uh, a better advisor, um, a better friend over these last two years. The really good news from my perspective, though, is that after uh, a little bit of well-earned time off to uh, rest and, and refit, Ned is going to be prepared to reattack uh, and bring his wisdom again, to the department uh, and to me, so more about that later. And I'm also very grateful to Vinod Patel for picking up the baton now uh, so that we continue to provide the um, customer service for which we are increasingly renowned. So Ned, my friend, thank you. Thank you for your incredibly hard work, for your service, and thanks to all of you for letting me crash today. And then back to the, uh, <laughs> back to the show. Thank you, thanks, everyone. I I will. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, more, more to follow. <laughs> more, more on that. More to follow. And I'll be um, happy to answer any of your questions at the gridiron. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just say one thing with the, uh, I, I promise I won't make you take questions, but um, sir, what, what has um, really stuck with me over the past two years is what you said in your first staff meeting. Uh, and I think it was the first thing out of your mouth. I think it was January 26th of, uh, of 2021. And, um, at the senior staff, the first time we all congregated with you there, um, you uh, gave us our, our first instruction, and that is to, to lean forward um, and to always be out there making the case uh, about America, what we're doing in the world, how we're doing it, uh, and uh, with whom uh, we're doing it. And you added the corollary point that sometimes when you're uh, operating on your toes, you're going to fall flat uh, on your face. <laughs> uh, and I know I have um, I made very clear that that is true. Um, and each time where I've gotten ahead of my skis or I've fallen flat on my face, um, you have been uh, nothing but gracious about it. And um, uh, I've heard nothing but support from you and this team. And um, it's just an incredible, incredible um, group of people. And as I said to uh, the secretary this morning, he makes uh, what are very difficult jobs about as easy as they can be um, because we have you as a model. and. We get to work with you day in, day out in such a tremendous team. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Where were we? Uh, let's go to the answering the question about um, how the Supreme Court proposals yes. would affect your the, the American 
the U.S. goals yes. for equity between Israelis and Palestinians. So, I mean, Andrew, this is um, something, speaking of Secretary Blinken, that uh, he's had an opportunity to, to speak to. President Biden uh, has spoken to this as well, as we often do. Uh, we don't speak about specific proposals. Um, we're not going to weigh in on, on the merits of, of individual proposals. But um, as a democracy ourselves, as a democracy that is witnessing what is happening in democracies around the world, including in Israel, uh, we have perspectives on the process. Yeah. And the point we have consistently made uh, in the context of Israel and other fellow democracies uh, around the world is that uh, the most effective way to build consensus uh, for uh, the, the most effective way um, uh, to ensure that proposals are embraced is to build consensus for them. Uh, and that is something that uh, we have heard from Israelis as well. We know there's an ongoing dialogue uh, between the prime minister, between uh, the president. This is a conversation that uh, the people of Israel are having, as they uh, rightly should. Uh, but from our perspective, uh, that process of building consensus is always going to be key to durability. Uh, in some ways, you can't have durability without uh, consensus. Uh, but ultimately, the path forward is going to have to be one for uh, the people of Israel to decide. That said, understandably, but is the, the, the level, the extraordinary level of U.S. support for Israel in, in all regards, um, is, isn't that uh, intricately related to there being a democracy. Well, of course it is. Uh, of course it is, Andrea. And that is why we have the relationship we do have with Israel. We have uh, interests, but just as importantly in some respects, we have values. Uh, and the fact that Israel has been a thriving democracy in the Middle East since its founding in 1948 has connected our two countries, has connected our two peoples. It's precisely the reason uh, why uh, the U.S. president was uh, the first to recognize Israel within eight minutes or so of its founding in uh, 1948. So this has always been at the crux of our relationship. It is always going to be at the crux of our relationship. Um, there are difficult questions every democracy has to grapple with. We have been no exception to that, of course. And so as a friend to Israel, as a fellow democracy our, ourselves, we have offered uh, this advice in private. We've also offered it in, in public as well about uh, the imperative of finding, of achieving that consensus as proposals are being debated, even heartily debated. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I yeah. admire your capacity to, <laughs> to switch <laughs> immediately to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But um, uh, my question arguably will be a bit simpler. Um, I, I was, so the secretary uh, evidently spoke to the French, his French counterpart uh, today. Uh, there was a readout. Uh, could you expand on that readout, on that conversation? Uh, specifically, there was a mention of the Indo-Pacific and therefore looking forward to Monday's summit, uh, the AUKUS uh, group. Um, I wonder what the secretary told his counterpart, any reassurances, and uh, particularly on the issue of non-proliferation, which is uh, which will be key, obviously, in these summaries. Uh, so, Leon, on on this question, let, let me say that we did issue a readout. I'm not in a position to go uh, beyond that readout, but but as they often do, um, the secretary and the foreign minister had an opportunity to discuss uh, some of the issues that we care about deeply, um, some of the issues uh, on which we're engaged. Uh, the situation uh, in Ukraine, uh, of course, uh, always features in those discussions, or, or has of late, I, I should say, uh, but. And this goes back to what I was saying to Andrea in a, in a very different context. Uh, France is our oldest ally, and at the heart of that relationship is shared values. And what we enjoy with France is a global partnership, uh, a global alliance. It is a partnership that allows us to work together in Europe, in Africa, uh, other parts of the world, and yes, in the Indo-Pacific. And we're able to do that because uh, we share the same values and we share the same vision uh, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we very much share uh, the same vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. These value, values of freedom and openness, uh, they are critical to uh, what we're trying to support uh, in that region, just as they are critical to what we're trying to preserve uh, when it comes to Russia's brutal aggression uh, against Ukraine. Um, I'm not in a position to, to go beyond that. You asked about uh, non-proliferation non -proliferation standards uh, when it comes to uh, AUKUS. Uh, as you know, uh, when the AUKUS agreement was announced in September of 2021, um, we, we said at the time there would be this 18-month consultation period. Um, 
uh, to provide a uh, conventionally armed uh, nuclear-powered submarine, and I emphasize conventionally armed. Um, uh, these submarines are um, nuclear-powered, but they are conventionally armed, um, to deliver that capability to Australia at the earliest uh, possible date, and critically, in a way that meets the highest possible non-proliferation standards. We are committed to that. We're committed, as we know our Australian partners are, our British partners are, uh, and we've been uh, closely engaged not only with them, but also with the IAEA uh, on this question as well. Jenny. I have a couple of questions. North Korea fired multiple ballistic missiles into the West Coast yesterday. How would you comment on that? Uh, Jenny, I think you saw from our colleagues at uh, Indo-Pacific Command uh, that we condemn the most recent ballistic missile launch. Uh, this launch, like previous launch, launches in violation of multiple uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions. It poses a threat to the DPRK's uh, neighbors in the international community. Uh, and we remain committed uh, to a diplomatic approach to the DPRK, uh, and we call on the DPRK to take us up uh, on the offer that we have put forward consistently in multiple uh, venues and in multiple uh, forms. Uh, just as uh, we are committed to uh, diplomacy, uh, are we are likewise committed to the defense of our treaty allies and our uh, security uh, commitments to the ROK, uh, to Japan. Those are ironclad. We've talked a lot in recent days about the bilateral relationship we have with both of those countries, the trilateral uh, relationship that the three of us have, and that the work we're doing bilaterally and trilaterally on the challenge that uh, the DPRK poses to uh, the region and, and beyond. Okay, um, the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, told the Senate Intelligence Committee recently that uh, North Korea Kim Jong Un would you never give up the nuclear weapons program. Uh, will the U.S. keep its uh, diplomatic doors open and uh, continue to wait for dialogue with uh, North Korea, or will it seek for other measures? Jenny, our our policy approach. I think it's important to uh, differentiate between intelligence and policy. Uh, Director Haynes was speaking to our current intelligence assessment, uh, our current analysis uh, of uh, the DPRK regime. Uh, our policy is something separate, uh, our, and our policy approach is predicated on what we would like to see happen, what would be in our interests. And it would be profoundly in the interests of the United States and countries uh, around the world if we were to fulfill uh, the objective that we set forth, set forth, and that is an objective for the complete denuclearization uh, of um, the uh, of the Korean Peninsula. Um, we have uh, made very clear that these programs pose a challenge uh, not only to our treaty allies but to the United States. We want to achieve this and make incremental progress towards this through dialogue and diplomacy. Now, of course, the DPRK hasn't uh, responded to that outreach. Uh, that offer remains, uh, and we do hope that uh, the DPRK changes its position, it ceases with the provocations, uh, and demonstrates a willingness to engage in the uh, genuine offer of diplomacy that we put forward. But the North Korean ambassador in Geneva you know, recently stated that there will be no talks for denuclearization. How are you uh, waiting for a dialogue? Because uh, Jenny, we've seen periods of, of provocation from the DPRK, and we've seen periods of engagement uh, with the DPRK. I think it's very fair to say that uh, we are in the depths of a period of provocation uh, at the moment. We've seen a record number of launches, uh, of, of tests, uh, of other uh, forms of provocative behavior. We are seeking with our partners around the world, including uh, action in UN, action that we've taken, including action this month, and actions that our uh, partners and allies are taking, uh, to make clear to the DPRK that the costs are going to continue to increase until and unless uh, it changes its approach. We want to see the DPRK change its approach in the direction of dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, this is um, uh, what we have put forward multiple times now. Uh, we believe that through dialogue and diplomacy, we can make the kinds of incremental, real, practical progress uh, towards that um, overall objective of denuclearization uh, of the Korean Peninsula. Goyal. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, 
Uh, before my two questions, just my personal views. Uh, I wish you all the best, first of all, and I hope this is for your best and better and promotion. You deserve that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say maybe next uh, ambassador or so somewhere. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, two questions. One, uh, Secretary was here, of course. Recently, Secretary was in India, and was he carrying any message from the President? And he had met many, many uh, foreign ministers, and uh, Indian foreign minister, and of, of course, the Russian uh, foreign minister, but also uh, embassy staff and all that, which he always does that. So was he carrying any message from the President, and what, where we stand now as far as the recent visit to India is concerned? Uh, so, Goyal, the Secretary did have an audience with uh, the Prime Minister when they were in New Delhi for uh, the G20. Uh, he had a chance to speak to the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm just not in a position to detail uh, what was exchanged between uh, the Secretary and the Prime Minister. But uh, our message uh, to India and about India is consistent. Uh, India is a global strategic partner of the United States. Uh, the engagements we've had with our Indian partners at the ministerial level, at the leader level, uh, at all levels, has been in furtherance of deepening the uh, already extensive ties uh, between our two countries. These are ties that are political in nature, diplomatic, economic, security, uh, and importantly, people-to-people -people ties. Uh, there is a vibrant Indian diaspora uh, in this country. There is, uh, there is um, uh, quite a bit of interest on the part of the American private sector uh, in India exchange students. Uh, there are various ways in which our two societies are intertwined. So every time we have an opportunity to meet with our uh, Indian counterparts, it is uh, an effort to deepen uh, what is that, that already uh, quite extensive global strategic partnership. My second question is, uh, that was actually, uh, as far as the budget is concerned, recently I have been interviewing or talking to many, many uh, American Pakistanis in their area. What they are telling me is that as far as uh, budget is concerned or any U.S. or global help to Pakistan is concerned, that goes in the pockets of the corrupt politicians or military dictators and U.S. especially or other countries when they are sending money to Pakistan for the development of the people uh, that may be hurricane or earthquake or any other natural or uh, internal disasters are concerned, it never reaches to the people more than 1%. And uh, the money should go to the directly to the people, not to the corrupt politicians or corrupt military dictators, because they said recently, uh, the, uh, Mr. Bajwa, he may have taken billions and billions of dollars after retiring as military dictator, but now he said to the next one, now it's your turn. So, and the uh, question is that internally situation is so bad that it may happen a civil war within Pakistan because Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Imran Khan and all those things as you know going on. So, can you make sure that I can tell them now to these my friends, Pakistani friends that next time any uh, help or any money goes to the, from the U.S. or international community will go to the, directly to the people for their development that's supposed to be. A couple things, Goyal. So first on uh, political questions. Those are questions for the Pakistani people uh, to decide for themselves. The United States uh, does not uh, take a position. Uh, we only take a position in support of Pakistan's uh, democracy and its constitutional system. Uh, our goal for Pakistan is uh, a country that is peaceful, stable, and prosperous. And, and you reference this, but Pakistan has uh, encountered economic headwinds uh, of late. Uh, they, the Pakistani people, are, are facing uh, record levels of inflation. Of course, this comes on the back on the back of uh, the uh, extensive flooding uh, through parts of the country, uh, and it has only put a spotlight on our need to continue to work together uh, to help the Pakistani people um, on a uh, put them to help put themselves on a sustainable uh, economic path and a durable path to uh, the prosperity that we seek for the Pakistani people. Uh, there are, uh, there's a reform agenda uh, that the Pakistani uh, government is in the midst of. We encourage Pakistan to continue working with the IMF, uh, especially on reforms that will improve Pakistan's business environment. Uh, and we know that doing so will ultimately make Pakistani businesses more uh, attractive and competitive uh, around the world. 
uh, this is a country with tremendous potential, and um, we have partnered with Pakistan. We want to make sure that uh, the resources that Pakistan has uh, itself, the resources uh, that the United States is contributing, uh, that other countries are contributing, and the resources uh, that have and, and uh, will continue to come from international financial institutions, uh, they're managed uh, responsibly as part of uh, responsible and responsive governance. Let, let, me, let, me, let me move on just to go ahead, Kylie. Wrongfully detained in Iran since 2015. He um, gave an interview today to Christian Amanpour from Evan Prison, and um, he said a lot. But a, a few of the things he said is that he's deeply worried that the White House doesn't understand how dire his situation is. Obviously, he's been left behind multiple times when other prisoner swaps have happened. Um, he called it deeply upsetting that Biden hasn't met with his family. Um, I know there's not much you can say about White House meetings for families of Americans wrongfully detained, but what is your response to the fact that he took this risk and went on CNN, gave this interview to make this plea um, so publicly from Evan Prison? Kylie, I think our response is uh, less about the, the brave decision from Mr. Namazi and more about the cruel practice that we have seen from the Iranian regime uh, to arrest, detain, and to hold um, wrongfully for, in many cases, years on end, as is the, as is the case with Siamak Namazi, for political leverage. Um, this is a cruel practice. It is a practice that uses humans, human beings, as political pawns. It is a practice that Iran has engaged in over uh, the long term. We have made very clear to the regime since the earliest days of this administration the priority we attach to seeing the prompt release of those Americans who are <coughs> detained wrongfully. We are always going to stand up for the rights of our citizens uh, who are wrongfully detained, and, and that, of course, includes uh, Siamak Namazi. Uh, senior officials from this building, as well as from uh, the White House, meet and consult regularly with the Namazi family, uh, and will continue to do so until this wrongful and unacceptable detention uh, comes to an end. Uh, we are committed not only to this case, but to continuing to work to free all of those Americans around the world uh, who are wrongfully detained. Uh, in some cases, uh, we have uh, the world has seen uh, the fruits of those efforts, and, and Americans have come home from Afghanistan, Burma, Haiti, Russia, Venezuela, West, Af West Africa, uh, and other locations where they've been held. Our fervent hope is that Siamak and the other two Americans who are wrongfully detained in Iran uh, will soon be uh, among that list. That Siamak um, and those other two Americans um, are any closer to being released today than they were, you know, when the Biden administration came in more than two years ago. Now, I don't think it's helpful for us to characterize the status uh, of our efforts to see these uh, Americans freed. Um, nor am I in a position to characterize what the last administration may or may not have done. Uh, but what I can tell you is that. Uh, we made very clear um, in an unambiguous way to the Iranian regime uh, within days of this administration the priority we attach to seeing the release of uh, these three individuals. It is a wrongful practice. It is a practice that should be ended everywhere and anywhere. Uh, and the Iranians know uh, that we are going to do everything we possibly can uh, to bring back uh, these Americans who have, they have kept from their loved ones for uh, far too long. Gita. Thanks. Um, in your talk, and you, you talked about this. Uh, from your tone, I got the sense that you sounded a little more optimistic than previous times. I know you're not going to answer directly to this, but uh, what can you say? I I mean, there's really not much I can say. Our overriding objective is to bring these Americans home, to bring home every American who's wrongfully detained anywhere around the world. Uh, if we start to um, suggest where we are in negotiations or where we aren't for, for that matter, it certainly doesn't help our efforts to uh, fulfill that, that overriding objective. Uh, we are working on it. We are working on it relentlessly, but that's as far as we can say. Could the Iranian New Year be a target date? I'm sorry? Could the Iranian New Year 
10, 12 days away be a target date? Uh, the target date we have is today. It is tomorrow. Uh, that has been the case for the entirety of this administration. We want to see this practice of wrongful detention uh, put to an end as soon as we can. Uh, uh, okay. How do you view the Iranian authorities allowing uh, Simak Namazi uh, showing uh, up on CNN from the prison? Look, I'm not going to weigh in on, on their thinking. Um, uh, I think we all may have theories uh, about why they did this. Um, the fact is that they are holding Siamak and Murad Tabaz and Ahmad Shargi uh, for political leverage. Uh, they may think that uh, they can exact additional uh, leverage uh, from these types of, of practices. Uh, our message to them is that um, we want to see these Americans returned home. Uh, and this is a practice that, with partners around the world, uh, we are working to eradicate around the world and uh, to hold accountable those regimes who engage in it. Uh, there should not be this practice of holding human beings as political pawns in the 21st century. Uh, Alex. So what if you have anything to add to the U.S. Embassy's uh, statement on the latest developments? And what's your level of uh, optimism? Uh, I think I should say cautious optimism um, after all these developments. Uh, can the Georgian Dream government be trusted? And also, uh, how much of these latest developments damaged your relationship with Georgia? Uh, so Alex, uh, and I think you saw a statement that came from our embassy in Tbilisi as well. But it's very clear that the Georgian people have once again spoken clearly uh, that the only choice for Georgia is a secure and prosperous European future. Uh, we, while we welcome the decision to withdraw the draft law on quote unquote foreign influence, we urge the ruling party to officially retract this bill and not to further this type of legislation, uh, precisely because it's incompatible uh, with Georgian and Euro-Atlantic values and the protection of fundamental freedoms. Uh, we encourage Georgia's political leaders to work together in earnest uh, on the reforms urgently needed to obtain the EU candidate status that Georgia's uh, citizens overwhelmingly desire. But the, the point of all this, uh, Alex, is that over the course not only of the past couple of weeks, but uh, over several decades now, uh, the Georgian people have made very clear uh, with their voices, with their expression, uh, that they seek a Georgia that is democratic, that is prosperous, uh, and that is integrated into the Euro-Atlantic uh, region. They did that uh, again, and the United States will continue to be a partner to those aspirations. Thank you. Ukraine, do you have anything on the latest wave of um, Russian missile strikes? Is it your impression that Russia has become emboldened even more than last week? previous weeks? Uh, Alex, it's, it's difficult to speak to just how emboldened the Russians are when you have a starting point of uh, this brutal aggression uh, that is now well, uh, uh, we're now uh, well into the second year, uh, that sought to topple the government, uh, subjugate uh, the Ukrainian people, uh, and erase Ukraine from the map. That was a bold ambition to start with. Uh, it is uh, also the fact that um, these types of strikes, uh, Russia has tried to make them the new normal. Uh, it has only been a few weeks since we've seen strikes across the country on this scale. The fact that this has become, because of President Putin's actions and decisions, uh, what they would like us to view as the new normal um, speaks to that level of brazenness uh, and uh, the level of brutality that they are willing to perpetrate uh, against the Ukrainian people. So our charge is to work with the allies and partners around the world uh, to make clear that this can't be normal. Uh, we cannot become numb to this. Uh, Russia's efforts to wipe out uh, power generating facilities, uh, food uh, and agricultural uh, storage sites and uh, agricultural uh, infrastructure. Uh, it is part and parcel of an effort to hold the people of Ukraine hostage uh, to President Putin's objectives uh, and to his will. Uh, the people of Ukraine, on the other hand, have demonstrated very clearly um, that they won't be subdued, uh, they won't be held hostage, 
and they're going to continue to defend themselves uh, with the support of the United States and, and our partners and allies around the world. Thank you so much. And my final question on different region, uh, I may, I may ask you, Sean. The U.S. intelligence uh, yesterday announced that it predicts uh, tension uh, in, in their relationship in the absence of a peace treaty. I'm just wondering, moving forward, how much urgency does it add up in terms of the, you know, uh, your, your, your efforts to uh, bring about the peace to the region? There, there's always been urgency uh, with this, uh, Alex, and there's been urgency because uh, this is a, a delicate situation. It's a situation that uh, is far too prone to violence, as we've seen in, in recent days uh, in the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, region. Uh, and it is a, a long-standing conflict that the United States would uh, like to do everything we can uh, to support its resolution. Uh, we're going to continue to do that uh, by working bilaterally uh, with these countries, trilaterally uh, with Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, supporting their own efforts at uh, dialogue and diplomacy, uh, but also through um, all appropriate mechanisms to help um, these countries themselves conduct the diplomacy and reach the agreements uh, that we hope uh, that they will uh, be able to make. Uh, yes. Thank you. Now, this is about the uh, U.S. intelligence report released recently um, in which United States expressed concern um, about the peace and security of South Asia, uh, mainly because of Pakistan-India tensions. Uh, Pakistan offered uh, I can, uh, like offer to have a peace talks with India many times, but Indian government, you know, try to uh, avoid that. So when you engage with Indian authorities, what what reason they say why they don't want to talk to Pakistan on the on the pending issues? I, I will speak to the message we send to both India and Pakistan. Uh, we support constructive dialogue. We support diplomacy between India and Pakistan to resolve. Again, another set of long-standing disputes. Uh, we are uh, a partner. We are uh, willing to support that process in any way that they deem appropriate. But ultimately, these are decisions uh, that India and Pakistan themselves are going to have to make. So many uh, analysts believe that the United States has the power and authority to mediate between the two partners. Pakistan and India is, you know, partners of Europe. So why don't you just mediate? Because these are decisions for the countries themselves. Uh, if uh, they agree uh, on a particular role for the United States, the United States is uh, prepared to, as a partner to both countries, support that process in any way that uh, we responsibly can. But ultimately, uh, it is not for the United States to determine the modalities or the way in which uh, India and Pakistan engage one another. Uh, what we support is constructive dialogue, uh, meaningful diplomacy between India and Pakistan in the first instance to resolve uh, long-standing conflicts. Last question. Uh, I hope you're aware about the police bet in charge on the women at the Women's March. I know you try to avoid commenting on the domestic issues, but uh, this is like a brutal attack on the women during the Women's March on the International Women's Day. Uh, we've seen those reports, uh, and unfortunately, we've seen reports of uh, violence and repression uh, against uh, marches on International Women's Day uh, around the world. Um, we condemn reports of police violence against peaceful protesters who took to the streets to defend their human rights and fundamental freedoms across the globe uh, on International Women's Day. Uh, it is to us reprehensible that uh, some countries on International uh, Women's Day, a day for the international community to come together to celebrate the leadership and contributions and accomplishments of women and girls, was marred uh, in far too many places by violence and repression against the very persons uh, we came together to honor. Uh, women and girls uh, deserve the ability to exercise their freedom of expression, uh, their right to peaceful assembly, uh, and association without fear or retribution. Uh, we know from experience that governments that uh, treat women and girls equally, um, uh, that, that fail to treat women and girls uh, equally and that don't respect uh, their fundamental uh, human rights are societies that uh, are not in a position to reach their full potential. Yes. The defense minister, uh, during a press conference with Secretary Austin, said Tehran's pursuit of nuclear weapons requires Israel to be ready for any action, and important decisions lie ahead, he said. He signaled uh, as if some military contingencies uh, are not too far now. Uh, does the administration share this sense of urgency with the Israeli administration regarding Iran? Uh, we share the assessment that Iran's nuclear program is an urgent challenge. We have a solemn commitment uh, that Israel, uh, excuse me, that Iran 
uh, will never acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, we are determined uh, to make good on that commitment. Uh, we believe the most effective means by which to uh, fulfill that commitment is through diplomacy. Only through diplomacy can we achieve a permanent and verifiable uh, solution to the challenges that are posed by uh, Iran's nuclear program. Uh, diplomacy is always going to be our first resort, but if we aren't met with a willing partner on the other end, uh, it won't be our last resort. Uh, so we're always engaged in um, uh, consultations with allies and partners around the world about this challenge because it is a challenge uh, that has, has implications for our friends around the world. You appear to share the sense of urgency, but you don't appear to share the, the, the same method that should be addressed. You are saying diplomacy. Israelis are signaling or somehow implying military action. Do you think that you are on different pages with Israeli administration? I, I will leave it to my Israeli uh, counterparts uh, to speak for uh, their own approach. Uh, we have discussed our approach with them uh, at the highest levels. Uh, it was a discussion between Secretary Blinken and the Prime Minister and uh, other Israeli counterparts when we were in uh, Israel. Uh, earlier this year, um, our Israeli partners know because we are uh, transparent with them uh, the fact that we believe that only diplomacy can can achieve a solution that is durable uh, and that will um, provide a, a a permanent resolution uh, to the challenge of Iran's nuclear program. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. So Saudi Arabia, we have seen a report that Saudi Arabia is asking the United States to provide security guarantees and uh, help to develop civilian nuclear programs as Washington tries to to broker diplomatic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Do you have anything on that? Can you just? I, I don't have anything to offer on that specific report. Of course, it's well known that uh, we are uh, a full and eager proponent of normalization uh, between um, Israel and its um, Muslim majority and Arab neighbors, uh, both near and far. Uh, we have had conversations uh, with countries almost literally uh, around the world uh, on this front. And we're going to continue to support uh, Israel's efforts, our collective efforts, uh, to expand the set of bridges uh, that Israel has been in position to build uh, with its uh, Arab and Muslim majority neighbors and also uh, other countries. But I don't have anything to offer on that specific report, Ian. Uh, okay comment on the Saudi foreign minister visit to uh, Moscow and the commitment uh, to increase commerce between uh, the two countries? Uh, I'd refer you to uh, the Saudis for comment on uh, the foreign minister's visit. Uh, I would just add that the visit does follow uh, a very recent visit of this foreign minister uh, to Kiev, where he announced uh, that Saudi Arabia will deliver $400 million in critical humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. Uh, including uh, $300 million in energy products. That was the first visit of a senior Arab official to Ukraine since the war began. We've also seen our Saudi partners uh, vote repeatedly, uh, including as recently as uh, February 24th, just last month, in the UN General Assembly to support Ukraine's territorial integrity uh, and the principles of, of the UN Charter. Ian? I, yeah, I just wanted to quickly ask on Poland. Uh, do you have any comment about the Polish Foreign Ministry calling in the U.S. Ambassador over this uh, documentary critical of, of the late Pope John Paul II uh, aired on a local broadcaster, which is owned by Warner Brothers Discovery? Uh, I don't, beyond uh, noting that the ambassador uh, was at the Foreign Ministry for uh, discussions. Uh, I'm not in a position to, to detail those discussions. Can I ask a quick question? I have to answer. Okay. okay. The Washington Free Beacon claimed that uh, the Taliban are in position of $7.2 billion worth of American arms that were left behind, including airplane, uh, ground to air missiles, and so on, that pose a threat to U.S. interests. Do you have any comment on that? I'm not familiar with uh, that report, uh, and that's an issue that uh, our colleagues at the Department of Defense uh, would be in a better position to uh, respond to. What I can say is that um, since August of last year, uh, we have found that uh, previous estimates, and I can't speak to this one because I'm not familiar with it, uh, of uh, material that may be in the Taliban's possession that was left behind uh, after uh, the evacuation. Um, those estimates were um, uh, inflated uh, by a, a large degree, but I, I can't speak to this. Uh, yes? Hi, thanks. Uh, Josh Keating here. I was wondering, can you clarify at all the U.S. position on whether crimes committed by the Russian military in Ukraine fall under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? 
given that Russia is not a state party to the court. And do you anticipate that the U.S. would provide evidence or any other assistance to the court in uh, investigating such crimes, given that the U.S. is also not a member of the court? Uh, so first, uh, a couple things. Um, over the past two years, the United States uh, has worked hard to improve and to, in fact, reset uh, our relationship with the International Criminal Court uh, through, in the first instance, the lifting of sanctions that uh, we think should never have been imposed uh, in the first place, a return to engagement uh, with the court and the Assembly of States Parties, and identifying specific areas uh, where we can support um, uh, ICC investigations and prosecutions, including steps to support the, the, courts, the court's work in Darfur and assistance in uh, locating and apprehending uh, fugitives from international justice, including uh, the LRA leader, Joseph Kony. Uh, we also offer rewards for information leading to the arrest, transfer, or conviction of foreign nationals accused of committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide before uh, the ICC. Uh, but what we don't discuss is uh, the specific forms of support. Uh, that we may or may not be providing to the ICC. We don't want to do anything uh, that could um, jeopardize uh, the uh, sanctity of, of an investigation that could set back uh, the pursuit of, of justice. Uh, yeah. So now a jurisdiction question over whether uh, the court would have jurisdiction over we, Russian crimes in Ukraine? We, we support uh, the investigation that the prosecutor has announced. Uh, Ukraine is a, is a state party of the ICC. Yes. Uh, since March uh, 13, uh, U.S. South Korea military exercise will start. Uh, do you think yesterday the missile launch is something related with that? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, so uh, since March 13, U.S. Um, South Korea military exercise, uh, exercise will start. Uh, do you think yesterday's uh, uh, missile launch is something related with uh, those things? I, I, I couldn't say uh, the motivation behind uh, the DPRK's launch. Uh, if they are under the mistaken impression that uh, the defensive exercises that we're conducting with uh, our partners, the ROK and Japan, uh, are intended to uh, pose a threat to the DPRK, they're mistaken. Uh, we are exercising only because uh, the DPRK has uh, engaged in provocations uh, and has uh, put us in a position to ensure that we're capable of making good on the ironclad defensive security commitments that we have to uh, our treaty allies, the ROK uh, and Japan. We've stressed time and again that we harbor no hostile intent towards uh, the DPRK. We're ready and able to engage in dialogue and diplomacy to bring about what is our overarching uh, policy goal, but uh, the DPRK has met those offers with uh, only uh, additional provocations. Yeah, Shannon? is that those two dead American citizens who were kidnapped in Mexico are still in the morgue in Mexico. I was wondering if you could tell me if that's the case, and if so, why it's taking so long to get them repatriated? So our consular staff in Mexico are assisting in line with the, the wishes that the families have put forward uh, with making arrangements to transport the deceased and their, their personal effects back to the United States. I think it's fair to say that we are in the final uh, stages of doing just that. Uh, we'll continue to work around the clock uh, until their remains are repatriated back to the United States. Of course, uh, all throughout this, we have offered our uh, most sincere condolences uh, to uh, the families, the loved ones uh, of the victims, uh, as, as we keep in mind uh, the Americans who were uh, released from captivity. Uh, we are working on this as, as diligent, diligently as we can. What I can say as a general matter that uh, there are oftentimes uh, processes that need to be completed. Some countries uh, require, for example, that an autopsy be conducted uh, before uh, the remains are repatriated. But as we do in all cases, um, uh, in all similar cases, uh, we are working around the clock to uh, affect that repatriation. And just to follow up as I can, uh, a Mexican cartel appears to have taken credit or uh, blame, however you want to put it, for these kidnappings and the murders. Can you say that, will the administration rethink its position on designating a cartel or more cartels as foreign terrorist organizations? So as for the claim, I've seen that claim. Um, this would be a claim that our law enforcement uh, colleagues and our Mexican counterparts would uh, need to speak to. We're just not going to uh, speak to the investigation or its status. We're going to use every tool that is appropriate and that's available to us uh, to pursue uh, these transnational uh, criminal organizations, these um, uh, drug trafficking organizations to the fullest extent. 
uh, they not only uh, breed the insecurity that uh, is pervasive in uh, parts of parts of Mexico uh, that we've spoken to in our travel advisories, but uh, they also, of course, have um, a, um, an impact on Americans in the United States across the border. So uh, it is a uh, focus of ours. We have designated them and pursued them uh, vigorously with the authorities that uh, are available to us. But um, we're going to continue with our Mexican partners uh, to look at all the tools that may be available to make sure uh, that we're tackling this, ch this challenge as effectively as we can. Yeah, final question. Uh, about Syria, an estimated 8.8 .8 million individuals have been affected by the earth earthquake, as you know that, and 10,000, more than 10,000 buildings have been partially destroyed. Uh, about 55,000 households as displaced leave them as displaced either within or between assessed communities. You know, North East Syria is different than Turkey. Turkey has a government and they are helping those people who have been affected by the earthquake. Do you have any plan to help those people who are looking for a hand to bring them out from this dire situation? Uh, so first, when it comes to the earthquake, we are committed uh, to our Turkish allies. We are committed to the people of Syria. Uh, nationality, uh, of course, means nothing when you are suffering uh, the implications of a natural disaster like this. And our commitment of resources, our commitment of um, uh, focus, uh, that is for both the Turkey, the people of Turkey and the people of, of Syria. Uh, in these early weeks, uh, we have put, when it comes to Syria, an emphasis on seeing to it that humanitarian aid is flowing from Turkey into Syria uh, so that when it comes to our contribution of $185 million, uh, we can uh, ensure or do everything we can to uh, facilitate the passage and transfer uh, of that assistance across the border uh, into Syria. The rest of the world is stepping up as well, uh, and we want to see the uh, we want to see the border crossings uh, that have uh, now been opened uh, continue to operate. Uh, to have uh, trucks and convoys continue uh, to be able to transit from Turkey into Syria, so that people across Syria uh, can receive this this much needed uh, assistance. Uh, of course, our commitment to the people of Syria uh, is longstanding over the course of the past 12 years, over the course of the Syrian civil war. Uh, we've contributed some $15 billion uh, to the humanitarian response that's been necessitated by uh, what the Syrian regime, unfortunately, has perpetrated uh, on the people of Syria. Uh, far too many Syrians have been forced to flee uh, from their homes.